Welcome to this identity series at City of Hope. All first time visitors qualify for a free cappuccino in our coffee lounge after the service. To the left of the auditorium is a mother's and feeding room for your convenience. All kids are welcome to join City Kids during our services. All teens are invited to City Youth this Friday at 6.30. All teens don't miss out on our City Youth Bash on the 17th of June at 6.30. We apologize for any inconvenience caused by our renovation project. Once complete, we believe it will enhance your experience at City of Hope. Small groups are the best way to grow at City of Hope. These include groups for school leavers, young adults, young families and adults. We have two amazing opportunities for you to give back this winter. Operation Love, where you can donate the blanket, beanie or non-perishable food. Get your pledge form from the back of the auditorium and join the outreach on the 25th of June. Donate a Bible to an inmate in our local correctional facility and change a life. We're looking for a reliable, hard-working young man to assist with gardening, maintenance and security. If you're that person or if you know of someone, please contact the church office. Armor Bearers is our men's ministry here at City of Hope. The next meeting takes place on the 25th of June at 7.30 a.m. Our next Dream Team meeting takes place at 11 a.m. in the church hall on the 26th of June. But this morning, I want to speak to you about your identity. And I want to use something that I used. I, I, I found the photographs from 2017. Desiree and myself uh, traveled to Italy in, uh, I think it was 2016. And these photographs I used in a sermon. And I preached on the masterpiece of God. And I went back to that sermon. And I looked at that sermon and God gave me a revelation. And I want to really dig deep with you this morning because what I want to say to you is many of us are living like work pieces instead of masterpieces. We're living like work pieces instead of masterpieces. And God, in His great love for mankind, has created masterpieces. But we, dear sons and daughters of the Most High God, have allowed the world to conform us into such a degree that many of us have lost our identity. And you see, if you don't realize that you are a masterpiece in God's hands, you'll never carry and walk in the authority that God has given you. If you don't realize that a masterpiece is a living piece for God, then you'll never ever experience that joy and that fulfillment and the purpose that God has for your life. You see, when we visited Italy some few years ago, we happened to, not happened, we planned to visit Tuscany. Tuscany is one of my favorite cities. Been to Venice, been to Rome a couple of times. But Tuscany is one of those places that just stand us, like the vineyards, the, the wine lands of the Cape. But it's even more beautiful. And Florence, the city in Tuscany, is one of those cities that hosts some of the greatest art pieces that the world has ever seen. And there's a picture of Florence. Yeah, you can see the dome. And uh, just a little way from that is what they call the Galleria dell'Accademia, which is the gallery where one of Michelangelo, the great artist, great sculptor, one of his greatest works stand in the Galleria dell'Accademia. Beautiful place. And some of the most exquisite art pieces. And the two of us who've studied art, and man, we, we, we looked at this and we thought, this is it. God has really fulfilled one of our dreams to be able to be in this place. And what is striking about coming into this gallery where a thousand people, more than a thousand people queue every day to get into the gallery. Every day, more than a thousand people. And we were blessed that day because we had... Uh, a special ticket that allowed us in. And we try to spend as much of our time in the main area where Michelangelo's masterpiece is. Now to get to his masterpiece, you walk through what I've called the God of honor. It's all unfinished works. There you can see some of them. It's not one of my best photographs. But there are statues 
that are still almost like petrified in the marble or the granite that was used. It's like they trapped, prisoners trapped, trying to break out. Because you see a hand or you see a neck or you see a head or you see a foot. But the complete body is enshrined in this marble or granite. And so you only see something of someone that seems to be wanting to break out. And it forms these unfinished works, these work pieces, I call them. They're just work pieces. They were never finished. They were actually intended to um, adorn the tomb of Pope Julius II. And Michelangelo died. And so those pieces were never completed. But today they form a God of honor to the greatest Michelangelo's works, the masterpiece called the David. And there we have it. I don't know why Marianne censored that beautiful statue. Because that's not the photograph I took. But she did it to be sensitive to some of you viewers. All right. But anyway, there you can see Pastor Des stand at the bottom. That sounds bad, stand at the bottom of David. But <laughs> there she is. And we stand and we looked at this. A statue without flaws, a masterpiece without any imperfection, something that the artist Michelangelo perceived while it was still trapped in a block of marble. He saw the David. And he chiseled at that marble so that the David could escape. Come on, think about that. And you know, when I looked at that, the same thought came to mind about God. You see, David existed in the artist's mind. Before an artist, before Katunks, Katunks paints too, Desiree paints, before they paint, they see something. It's, it's conceived in their mind. And then they express it on canvas or they express it in a, in a sculpture. And you know what? God does exactly the same with you. You have been conceived in His mind long before time even began. I love that. And Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. He says, you and I are the workmanship of the great creator, the great artist, God himself. Isn't that beautiful? What you perceive as a masterpiece of Michelangelo God looks at your life and my life and He sees His masterpiece. Come on. But very often we've allowed the world to enshrine us so, to conform us and deform us like the God of honor. It's deformed us to have even lost our identity about who we are. Some of us even come to church and we're not sure even if we're saved. We're not sure about our status before God. We're not sure about our authority. And God is saying, but you are my creation that I saw before the world even began. You see, and I see those, those petrified, what seems to be petrified prisoners in the blocks of marble. That's the way I see the world. The world's trapped in its deformed ways. And that's how the world has got to us over these last two years in COVID. And this is what got me thinking. I thought to myself, God, so many people I've met up with over the last few weeks have felt trapped. They've felt unfulfilled. They've felt they've lost their purpose. They've felt um, insecure, obscure of this world. Like those statues, trapped, hiding, feeling not good enough, not valuable enough, unfinished. And I want to say to you this morning, when God looks at Monet and Rina, he sees his finished product. He sees his masterpiece. He doesn't see a workpiece. You see, we, we as, as human beings, we look around, we see workpieces. We compare ourselves to others all the time as workpieces. But what you really have around you are masterpieces. Come on, do you hear an amen? Yeah? Come on, just tell the person next to you, you're not a workpiece. Your masterpiece. Now, 
Listen to this word from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Written to the church in Ephesus. Also during difficult times, like we in, the church of Ephesus was in a difficult time, even though it was a prosperous. You go to the city of Ephesus today. It used to be the port. Today it's something like 13 kilometers away from the sea. You wonder, how, how can it be in a port? It shows you how geographically lands have changed. And what was a prosperous place, Paul wrote to the Christians encouraging them because of, of the, the sordid lifestyle that was being practiced in Ephesus. He said, you've got to stand out, church. Yeah, it's difficult right now. Even with COVID, you've got to stand out, church. You're not just a workpiece of God. You're His masterpiece. Stand out. And so he writes the following. He says, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Now watch that. You created, Francois, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, God's prepared before time your works, your calling, your destiny, your purpose, what you should be doing. I love that. Like my, Michelangelo, he saw what he wanted. God is concerned. Let me tell you this morning. God is concerned about his workmanship. Because so many of us have perceived ourselves as just a piece of work. But we are his masterpieces. And the great shepherd, David, David affirms this. You see, David came out of a lifestyle where he knew rejection, where he knew isolation, where he knew what it was like to be downtrodden, to be made felt like he was unworthy. And he writes that great psalm, which I have preached from so many times, Psalm 139. And David writes the following. He says, verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. And I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. You see, Paul was affirming those words that David once wrote in a psalm. Where did David get that from? From life experience, from a crisis, from adverse times, from difficult times. David came to realize he was precious in God's sight. Even when the world scorned him, disliked him, disdained him, David knew who he was before God. He says, I'm fearfully, I love that, eh? I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on, if you, if you go into the Hebrew, the word fearfully and wonderfully made means I've been fashioned by the greatest designer, God. Come on, you are fashion designed. You are like that unique fingerprint. Come on. Nobody else has got a fingerprint like yours. Am I right? Well, when God looks at you, he sees a masterpiece, and he says, that's my masterpiece. Unique and original. Come on, somebody just lift your finger, your, your thumb up to you, and say, you're unique. Your masterpiece. There's no one else with a fingerprint like mine. So kiss it. Come on, you, you're precious. You see, that's how confident David was. He said, I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Come on. When you say that today, you know, people look at you and they say, you're brazen, you're overconfident. You come. Am I right? But a Christian is truly a masterpiece. needs to know that they're wonderfully and fearfully made. Skilled by the hand of God. Made, not just a piece of work, but a masterpiece. You see, you're an original. And this is so important. You know, when I look at this work, workmanship, it's an amazing word, workmanship. It comes from the Greek word poema. And poema means poem. So when God says, you are my workmanship, do you know what God is saying? You are motion, you are poetry in motion. You are my literature. I'm proud of you. Every word you speak is beautiful. It's artistic. Everything you write is beautiful. Everything you draw, you paint, you sculpt is beautiful. Every work you've done, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, and every good work is amazing. Poema. You're the poema in my hands. You're the poem. You, you're a poem in motion. I love it. Come on. You see, in David came, he understood that. 
He understood what it even meant, even though he wasn't around. When the writer writes in John chapter 14, verse 12, he says, and you shall one day do greater works than I am. The writer was speaking about Jesus, right? And the writer was saying, Jesus said his church corporately shall do greater works in the latter days, which is true, but it's not happening. It's not happening. Now during adverse times, during difficult times, during times of, of COVID, the church should be rising up and showing itself as the masterpiece of God. But what are we doing? We're retreating into the marble, into the granite. We, we're allowing the world to enshrine us in its negative ways, in the difficult ways. We're allowing the world to keep us trapped. And God is saying, hey, listen, my masterpieces need to be revealed. My masterpieces need to come along. You think Michelangelo, what he, what he conceived in his mind is a masterpiece. It is, but it's lifeless. As beautiful as it is, it's lifeless. But what God has created, skillfully wrought in His hands, He can breathe upon and He can give life. That's why we celebrate Pentecost. It's the time where, where God breathes into His creation. That we can come alive. That we can begin to make a difference. Come on, that's what the anointing is there for. The anointing is yoke destroying, burden removing. It's there for us to show the world that we're different. I, I seriously believe that the anointing is given so that we can go, uh, we can be more powerful in the works that God has given us. In the works against destruction, against the adversity that we face. God has given us that ability. And God is saying to you and to me, use that ability that I've given you. You see, you're an original. Yet we allow the world to clone us. We allow the world to enshrine us. We allow the world to deform us. God's perfect creation, trapped. Trapped. That's scary. Because that's how I'm seeing the church. The church right now should be alive. I mean, if you look at these last two years, even our own government has tried to enshrine the church, trap the church, captivate the church. Keep quiet, 50 people. Come on, what has happened? This is when we should be growing. Even if we, if we cannot, could not come together as, as thousands and as hundreds, we should have gone to the streets in a sense and, and shown the masterpiece that God has in us. Amen? You know, if I look at... David the shepherd in the Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 17, a beautiful passage. 1 Samuel 17, chapter 17, verse 38 says the following. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. Now watch that word, coat of mail. Just yesterday, going through my sermon, and I said to God, what's this coat of mail? Is he the postman? What's this guy? And I continued to read, and I, I read, David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Here's the first instance in the Bible of somebody that someone's trying to clone. Someone's trying to copy. Someone's trying to live through another person. Doesn't that sometimes happen? Fathers try and live through their sons. Or for mothers try and live through their daughters. We clone them. We want them to be what we wanted to be. Saul is looking at David and he's saying, because I become a failure, I'm going to look to you and you're going to be victorious and I'll take the credit. He's looking to clone, to copy. God is saying, you're not copy. And you see, praise God, David, who wrote Psalm 139, he came out of an adverse family, a dysfunctional family situation. He knew what it was like to find identity. And he doesn't allow us all. Even though he puts the stuff on. That coat of mail. You know what the coat of mail is, El? It's that mesh. You often see in the knights in shining armor. And they used to have this, this um, uh, like chain, links. And it was knitted together to form a vest, almost like what we would call a body vest, a bulletproof body vest. He would wear this chain. And do you know that on average, a coat of mail, just the body vest, would have weighed a 
approximately 27 kilograms. Now watch where I'm going. The hood that David would have put on, that was Saul's, would have weighed on average, on average, 11 kilograms. That gives us how many, Francis? 38, you get the prize. 38 kilograms. Now watch, on average. Was Saul an average man? No. The Bible says Saul was a head taller than anybody else. So he wasn't wearing average clothing. This looked ridiculous. David been drowned in this coat of mail. Am I right, Elb? With a sword, with a helmet, with his hood. Come on. Who's got a hoodie on here today? That's light. This hoodie weighs 11 kilograms on average. The Bible says David was a young and ruddy, good-looking man. What does that mean? He wasn't a big muscular Zeus. He wasn't Hercules. He wasn't, he didn't have big guns. He was the average boy. Average boy. And if it was average, probably weighing about 75 kilograms. Am I right? And he's carrying at least 38 kilograms under the uniform with the sword, with the helmet. It was more than his body weight. And he said, this is ridiculous. I've done, I've put it on to honor you, sir. But I cannot be cloned. I'm an original. You see, that's why he writes in verse 14, I've been skillfully wrought by the hand of God. He knew. He says, I've been beautifully fashioned. Come on, I'm a designer piece of God. Come on, who's a designer piece of God here this morning? Come on, just... Kiss that thumb once more. Because there's nobody else like you. Come on, Akees. Nobody else. Nobody else like Andre Fenter. Praise God, somebody would say. Amen. You know, I, I see today, I mean, my grandchildren, they've got things like a Barbie Ken. And then I see people having facelifts and nose jobs wanting to look like Ken and Barbie. Come on. You're not happy with yourself. I see people impersonating, be it Bill Clinton or Michael Jackson, so they can make money out of it, but they don't know who they are. I don't want Ian to impersonate me, and I don't want to impersonate him. Am I right? Because he's Ian, and I'm Andre. And I'm proud of who I am. And I love who I am. Because God made me like I am. And I'm the best that God could have made. Mwah. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm the best. Say, so I'm a designer special. Yeah. Romans 12 verse 2 says the following. Ah, watch that, eh? And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, the more you allow the world to clone you, you lose the value that God has invested in you. You lose the talent that God has given you. You don't become a workmanship or a piece of work in progress. God wants you to display your works. That's why Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, you are the workmanship of, of Christ. Show your works to the world. Come on, church, we're hiding. Or we're being cloned. It's scary. Jesus, I love, I love what Jesus says. And Jesus said this after 40 days in the desert. Listen, th that was difficult times. Tempted, not three times by the devil. Often you read that wrong. He was tempted every day. For 40 days, Jesus was tempted. He was tempted. He was tempted. But you know when he comes out that wilderness, Brendan, being baptized, he hears the voice of his father. His father says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. He hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't shown any works yet. 
You see, God had already perceived in his mind what Jesus would do. And he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. God was speaking into the future. Come on. And what does Jesus say? He comes out of that experience and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for I have been anointed. The masterpiece needs the breath of God. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us different. That's what makes us come alive. That's what makes us more valuable than the David in the Galleria Academia. Come on. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me. Watch this. He's anointed me to break free, to preach the gospel to the poor. To, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. What is Jesus saying? I've been set free from this world's enshrinement to the purpose that God has called me to. You see, that's why God wants to anoint His masterpieces so that He can use you for good works. And God wants to use you for good works. God wants to raise up His church and we stand out. And people will look at us and say, wow, you think that David looks good, but look at Alby. You think, come on. You think that David looks good, look at Charmaine. You think that David looked good, look at Wameni. I remember many coming out of a traditional Afrikaans church, joining this church some, some few years ago. And God healed him this very first service that he came to. He says to me before the service this morning, he says, Pastor, he says, he gaan my vandag genees, because he's suffering with a back problem. You see, the, God wants you and I to walk in an anointing. We cannot call ourselves masterpieces. The fulfillment of God's heart if we don't carry His anointing. If we don't show the works to the world. Come on, I want to show the world my God is alive in me. He's alive in me. That's what gives me hope. That's what makes my life different. Pastor Des will tell you, I can go back to the business world, I'll still make a success of it. But you know where I find myself the happiest? In His church. You know where I find myself the happiest? When I meet like with Derek yesterday and there's a joy in my spirit because I've seen what God has done in His life. When I look at Jen, that's what, that's what drives me. That's what drives me to see you being changed and set free. Come on, church. Otherwise, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to stand up here and, and just preach to you if there's nothing inside. God is looking to raise an original. And you that original. When the anointing of God is on you. Notice the verse 19 of Luke chapter 4. When Jesus completes the statement and he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the captives free in verse 19 he ends that statement and he says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord what does that mean you mean to say there was only going to be one year that would be acceptable to the Lord because of what Jesus was going to do no what Jesus started and every time the masterpieces of God begin to rise up. We create a climate for a season that will be acceptable. Come on, God is looking for His church right now in difficult times. You see, it's in adverse times that our true identity is often revealed. And it's usually revealed at its very best. It's in difficult times. I, I remember last year, Pastor Jan and myself having a look at the achievements of this church, you, in one year or 18 months of COVID, we had 70, was it 72? 72 achievements. We went online because of lockdown. Come on. You see what the devil meant for our harm, we've turned, God has turned it for our good. It's in adverse times, difficult times, Francis, that your true identity will show. 
When things are going easy, let me tell you, I've seen more Christians backslide when things are going too well. They backslide. Now, I'm not praying difficult times in you, please. But it's in those difficult times. You see, Jesus realized the next three years, three and a half years, were going to be difficult. But he would make this the acceptable season of God as he walks in his anointing, as he sets the captives free, as he gives sight to the blind, as he lets the lame walk. This will be the acceptable year of God. You see, when David, the shepherd boy, before he went into battle, before he experienced the worst of adversity, he'd been prepared for it. He knew what it was like to tear a lion apart, a bear apart. He knew what it was like to... to no rejection and to take the scorn of a brother and a father and maybe even a mother. He knew what that was like. And when he went to retrieve five pebbles, where would he have got pebbles? The Bible is very clear. It's pebbles. The Bible is very clear. It was in the valley of Elah. Some of you, Janice, can you remember? Just before lockdown, we came, the night before lockdown, we came back to South Africa from Israel. But I took you into the valley of Elah on our last day. And the Valley of Elah used to have a little river running through it. Today it's a stream. That's why the Bible speaks of pebbles. And David, I can, I can only use my imagination. I want, when I read the Bible, I want revelation. And I want to read between the lines because I can imagine as David went down to retrieve the five pebbles. Have you ever seen a stream not flowing and it's got little pools? And you sometimes see a reflection he saw his reflection in the pool, in the still waters of that stream. He saw not a shepherd boy like his father and his brothers saw. He saw not just a warrior. He didn't just see a giant killer. He didn't just see a king. You know what he saw? He saw himself as the apple of God's eye. Are you going to say to me this morning, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, you, like me, I always thought, well, just meant I'm the favored one of God. Well, it does mean that too, but it's much deeper. It's so much deeper. Because when David bent down and he looked into that water, he saw not only his own reflection, he saw in his eye the reflection of God. You see, because the apple of one's eye is a Hebrew expression, which means the following. The little man in your eye. Say the little man in your eye. You see, when God looks at you, He sees Himself in the pupils of your eye. And that's why the Hebrews say, the little man in your eye. God sees a reflection of Himself in His masterpiece. That's what makes you a masterpiece. That's why you're not just a workpiece anymore. Because you're reflecting the very image of God. Wow, come on, somebody say amen. amen. Hey, God looks at you this morning and he's seeing the apple of his eye. So I see myself in your sin and I'm pleased. You see, when Jesus came up out of those waters before he was tested, for three and a half years, that was a test. He heard the Father saying, this is my son, my only begotten son, my beloved, the apple of my eye. Do you know that David expressed those words in Psalm 17, verse 8? He wrote about it. He wrote about it before he picked up those pebbles. He knew how God felt about him. He says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Keep me. He didn't say, am I? He said, keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me under the shadow of your wings. Come on, what are you facing right now? This is the time. God to reveal you. These are, this is the acceptable year of the Lord. 
to reveal the masterpieces of God. You see, when that anointing is on you, you become the apple of His eye. He sees you. He sees His Spirit in you. I love it. I just love it. You see, that's why we read in Esther chapter 4 verse 16. Esther, she knew the presence of God. You see, people were selected. They were, they were anointed randomly like the Samsons, the Esthers. And Esther could confidently and boldly say, if I perish today, I perish, but I perish for my God. You see, that anointing will cause you to risk because you know that you are the apple of His eye. And because you're the apple of His eye, He will never forsake you. He's with you. I want you to think about this this morning. And as I wrap this up, you can remain enshrined in the granite of this world's ways. You can remain unfulfilled, frustrated, living without purpose for the rest of your life. You can remain to be just part of the God of honor to the other masterpieces of God around you. Or you can choose that this word that God has given me once again in my spirit will chisel at your spirit. And that on this Pentecost Sunday, that God will once again Pour out His Spirit to give life to the masterpiece. That every time you sing, TK, you'll give Him glory. That everything you do will give Him glory. That's why He's created you. And some of us don't believe in our value because we've never known that precious anointing of God on our lives. And this morning I want to give you the opportunity. You see, you don't know how many days you have. God does. And I don't want you to lose out and live with regret. You see, there's a voice that's whispering to you this morning. It's that negative voice that says, don't chance it. Don't chance it. Stay where you are. Or you can maybe pick up that voice of Jesus. Risk. Nothing to lose. More to gain. Or you hear that whisper of the Father. He says, this is my son. And this is my daughter. With whom I'm well pleased. And let Him breathe on you new life so that you realize you're the apple of His eye. Come on, who wants to be the apple of God's eye? And if you want to join me, stand to your feet and let's pray. I want you to break free if you've seen yourself being conformed to the ways of the world. If you see yourself in any way because of whatever it may be, be it fornication, be it gambling, it's, it's deformed you. Be it drug abuse, it's deformed you. It's trapped you. God is saying, I've come like those petrified statues in the marble it lead to the masterpiece. God is saying, I've come this morning to set you free. By my word, I chisel at your being to get you the way I first saw you conceived. Come on, who needs that prayer? We need a break free. So stand with me with your arms outstretched and your palms of your hands open and pray this prayer with me and say Father in that precious name of Jesus 
Will you come and chisel at my life this morning? Chisel away the excess marble that hides my true identity, that has concealed my purpose, that has frustrated. Oh God, I stand before you this morning giving you permission to start chiseling so that this workpiece, me, Lord, becomes your masterpiece. And God, for me to stand out, I need your anointing. I need a fresh anointing. I need your spirit, Lord, to come upon me once again. In Jesus' name. 